who I'd like to introduce you all to our excellent speakers. Dr. Stephanie Jones teaches in our graduate program and she is the Associate Professor at Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands. She's published several books and has worked across the world in human resources, recruiting, consulting, and training. Dr. Martin Tynan is currently VP Human Resources for a fast growing global technology organization headquartered in Palo Alto. Martin um, as, was a student of Dr. Jones having received his DBA from the Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands. His background includes senior HR roles in the global technology such as uh, Expedia and Amazon, where he helped scale these companies across Europe, Asia and North America. So welcome Stephanie and Martin. We are thrilled to have you here today. Um, and also would like to give a special shout out to uh, a guest on our panel here, our participant. It looks like we have our illustrious um, President Glensel Macy. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. So thank you and um, let's just get started. Steph, uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Tynan. Thank you very much, Robin. I hope everybody can hear me okay. And it's my, my great pleasure to be uh, part of a Nichols College event, um, having been an adjunct faculty for, for four years and um, <clears throat> teaching cultural awareness in global business. And, you know, we have a very nice class at Nichols College on Tuesday nights. And sometimes I'm in a different country uh, every, every uh, one of the seven nights of a class. Uh, Anyway, it's all great fun <clears throat> and I'm very happy to, to share with you uh, some of the findings of the book. I had the pleasure of working with, with Martin, which was a product of his, um, <clears throat> his doctoral thesis. So next slide, please, Martin. Great, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Martin, one of the, the duo of Stephanie and Martin today. So I'm coming from, from London in the UK. So I'm very, very uh, privileged to be talking with you today and want to thank Nichols College for providing the opportunity to, to have this conversation, this dialogue today. Um, so as, as um, Stephanie has said, the, 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 the product of the, of the book that we'll talk a little bit about and we'll share some of our experiences, um, really um, the motivation of this uh, came in two ways. Um, um, as as, as um, Robin has pointed out, I, I've come from a very practitioner background. So I, I've spent all of my career working in the area of human resources, and I've been very lucky in the organizations I've worked with. A lot of my role has been scaling um, organizations across uh, Europe, Asia, North America. Um, I've been very lucky to have uh, lived and worked in seven different countries. And my daughter, who is 14, has lived in 11 different houses. So. That's the sort of background that I have um, from, from my own experiences. So I've been very, very lucky to have those experiences. And so during those experiences, then I, I sort of built up some um, sort of hypothesis around things. But then the motivation behind the book and the motivation uh, behind my studies and, and I uh, worked with Stephanie uh, on this was really just to put some rigor uh, and put some academic robustness around some of my own experiences and sort of how we could marry both my practitioner background and my experiences in, in the organizations that I've worked with, with then some of the sort of more academic and research focused aspects of that. And I think having those dual pillars, I think brings a, brings a, a very interesting sort of uh, mix uh, to the book and, and adds a certain amount of sort of um, uh, to the book as well. So with that then, um, the, why does this matter? Uh, and this is the reason uh, sort of I came to this in the first place. So when I when I think about the sort of um, the organizations that I've worked with um, and I think about all the opportunities in those organizations and often when you're starting a company, when you're growing a company, whether it's a, it's an established company or it's, a, it's a going through a new venture, it's, it's really understanding about what, what, what will help you grow, what will help you scale, what will help you get bigger. And obviously, there's a lot around that. There's the product um, opportunity, there's the market opportunity, there's the revenue opportunity. But the area I focus a lot on is, is the people, and sort of the, that, that sort of intangible aspect of things, and particularly around the leadership. And sort of a lot of this is borne out by the fact that uh, when investors, when they look to sort of place a valuation on a company 
or look to put some of their own money into a company to help it to grow, they place around 30% of the decision and the weighting uh, on that leadership quality, what exactly that is. And in, in sort of Silicon Valley parlance, they, they talk about, do you bet on the horse or do you bet on the jockey? Do you bet on the product or the service or do you bet on the leadership team on the, the people in the organization? And more often than not, you're placing a bet on the people in the organization and the leadership in the organization. So this led me to sort of um, understand more, how can we think about that more? What does that mean in practice? What is that leadership quality really all about? And how can we identify what that is? And part of what we've talked about is, is this uh, metaphor of muscle, the entrepreneurial leadership muscle. And one of the reasons we've come up with that metaphor is that it's something that is both nature and nurture. It's, um, it can be developed. It can be enhanced. It can be sort of uh, built up in a certain way. So really, how do we think about um, taking some of the innate um, capability in people and in leaders, and how can we help them to develop that entrepreneurial leadership muscle? And so that was a, a lot of the background to this. So what I'll do is I'll just hand back to Stephanie then, who will just take a little bit um, through the genesis of the book, and then we'll really get in and explore a little bit more around that entrepreneurial leadership muscle and what that entails. Yes, well, this was Martin's doctoral thesis, which he started in September 2015 and, you know, finished um, five years later. These, um, they have a long, a long gestation, these kind of studies. And of course, the book was, it, it's become something quite different. But this is how we started. It was a, a qualitative research project and we interviewed in great depth uh, a number of leaders who had done this journey who had uh, been from a startup to a scaled up organization especially when you consider that the, the proportion of successful scale-ups <clears throat> from startups is tiny that's only five percent of companies that start up make it to the big time so uh, in this we identified uh, dimensions of leadership practice we actually created a framework so that uh, it was possible to measure the potential of an effective startup to scale up leader. Um, you know, we're still testing this, but anyway, this evolved into the book. So um, next slide, please, Martin. <clears throat> so in the book, we, we uh, took the main findings of the thesis and developed the seven workouts idea. And as Martin mentioned, we focused on this idea of muscle being developed. This actually came from one of the entrepreneurs that we interviewed. Starting point is thinking about leadership as a skill or a muscle that can be built and strengthened and needs to be used. And <clears throat> we felt that this was not just useful for startup to scale up scenarios, but for uh, reinventing a business model and a transforming an existing business, which may be hundreds of years old or a long time, uh, but still needs to keep evolving and changing. So next slide, please. In the book, we've divided each, each workout, each of the seven workouts into three areas. So we've kind of introduced the, the muscle to start with. We've then in, included <coughs> reflections of the entrepreneurial leaders. And we'll look at some of those today because that realized some of the challenges that people who are real life examples of this situation are going through in this journey that they're trying to follow. And then we sort of tried to make like a workout guide <clears throat> with um, uh, ideas and uh, uh, details on how you can actually go about building that muscle by practicing different scenarios and uh, trying them out just like you if you went to a gym and you had different weights for building up specific muscle groups. So um, I'll hand you back to, to Martin and he will summarize these seven muscles for us. Thank you very much for that, Stephanie. <clears throat> so as you can see, a lot of this came from um, both research and, and experience around this. And what we tried to do then was, was try to distill 
and all that sort of into some very, very practical things that leaders, entrepreneurial leaders, uh, people who want to be leaders in the future, people who want to be um, sort of entrepreneurs in the future as well, as well as people in more established organizations. Um, what, what are those sort of muscles to be developed as we think about those? So I'll take it to those in, in sort of a, a very, very high level, and, and then we'll take it through them in a little bit more detail. So as we, as we sort of um, condense this down, we then sort of coalesce around these sort of seven muscles to be developed, and we'll talk a little bit about those. So one of these is, is just letting go of autonomy. So as you can think about an entrepreneurial leader or someone who wants to start up their organization, often they're coming from a place that they want control. They want to be in control of the destiny. They, they have a passion about something. They have a, an opportunity about something. And so they, they want to control all things. But, but part of that then is, is sort of um, you can't do it all by yourself. And how do you let go? You need to bring new people on into your organization. You need to delegate. How do you sort of um, let them have responsibility in the organization? And often what we found with all these muscles, and it's very thematic through this, is it's just this balance. It's getting this balance right um, from your own um, capability and to the organizational capability as well. And at different points, where do you, where do you exercise the muscle in the right way? Um, the anticipating the future. And we think a lot about this because often um, as an as a entrepreneurial leader starting off in your journey or even starting off in a new project um, in an organization, you're thinking about now, what needs to happen now? But you also need to be thinking about in a different time frame what will happen in the future and how do you balance executing on what needs to happen today with recognizing that there is um, opportunity three months, six months, nine months, 12 down the line that you need to figure out. Um, it's also just shifting this focus. Um, from our research and from my own practical background as well, as often um, entrepreneurial leaders spot a market opportunity. There's a product, there's a service that they feel would do really well in the market. And so they have this very, very market-orientated perspective. And so they really understand what's going on in the market. But then you also need to shift that into your organization in the sense that how do you build the engine how do you do the operational excellence internally to match the market opportunity? How do you make sure that you get that balance right, that you're growing at the right scale, that as you acquire new customers, as you want to deliver to new customers, that you can actually um, perform that product or service to those customers? This role definition is a very interesting one, which we'll talk a little bit more about as well, is that um, often leadership teams, then, as you, as you start off on your journey of, entrepreneurship is it's all hands to the pump everybody doing everything at the one time right and there's not a clarity about who's actually responsible for paying the bills who's responsible for making sure that we're checking in with the customers just getting this role definition of course risk any business has risk um, and sort of as you start off in your organization it's likely that you have a single failure which is that your business just might not take off it might not go anywhere you might not even get the revenues to meet next month's bills. So I'm um, thinking about that risk, but then as you grow and you get bigger as an organization, you introduce more opportunity into your organization, but you also introduce more risk into your organization. And how do you move then from having that single point of failure to having more systemic risk? Um, cultural change. This is a huge aspect of any organization. We talk about a lot more detail. It says, how do we move from sort of cultural fit to culture additive. What does culture mean in our organization? What, how do we do things around here? How do we make decisions? How do we think about quality? How do we think about diversity and inclusion in the organization? How does our organization reflect the society and the environment in which we operate in? And then a major part then we found is this, this growth mindset. And you're probably well aware of this, that there's a lot <clears> of learnings <throat> along the way. Everything won't succeed the first time. How do you understand that uh, not succeeding and learning as part of that journey to um, organizational and sustainable growth. So again, as we've highlighted these um, seven muscles, um, entrepreneurial leadership muscles, what we'll do now is take you in detail through those and give you a flavor of uh, both practical examples, but also then the entrepreneurial voices that we've spoken to about these. Stephanie, I'll hand back to you. Okay. Okay, we started off with workout number one, all about <clears throat> letting go of this need for autonomy 
and embracing the importance of working with a team. And many people who become entrepreneurs and, and start up businesses, they've left big corporates where they've been told what to do by other people. And they are desperate for doing their own thing. But that kind of honeymoon period of enjoying autonomy, it mustn't just go on and on because then this is an appreciation of the need for help from others, of delegation, wider participation, and getting more people involved. And we found, and if we go on to our voices on the next slide, um, you know, people on the, the A's of our voices, these are people who have really worked that, that letting go of autonomy muscle. And they realize that you need people. who are going to disagree to get a better outcome. And then you have that camaraderie, that friendship, um, mutual support. Whereas the, the, B, the B people we interviewed, they kind of knew that they needed to do it, but they found it very hard to let go. And people in the C bracket, they just still wanted to be dominant and controlling um, of their, <clears throat> their organizations. And they're going to hit a brick wall sooner rather than later. So. In our muscle workouts, we, we thought what we, what we need to focus on here is um, wanting to share, uh, wanting to let go of this need for autonomy. Um, okay, I feel like an owner, but sharing that ownership, building trust and balance is this word that we've already mentioned a lot. And, you know, uh, being a coach and spending time uh, sharing and bringing on other people. So back to you, Martin. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, and, and a lot of the way in which we approached this was, was to think about how do, we, how do we identify that muscle, first of all? And then we bring in that voice of the entrepreneurs about their own experiences and then put in place these practical examples. So this one anticipating the future from here and now to strategizing long term. And, and again, it's this balance. Because often when you're starting off on your journey of building a company, founding a company, you're solving problems, you're, you're reacting to problems, you're solving them on a constant basis. Um, and then, but how then do you move then to avoiding the problems? And really, this involves kind of thinking in two different timeframes, thinking about what moves the needle today, but also what will move the needle tomorrow. And so instead of just reacting to the problems in this whack-a-mole concept, it's actually you're, you're more proactive about avoiding the problems in the first place right? and just getting that balance right in your organization. And again, it's the balance because it all comes down to this um, just being, you know, as Stephanie talks, there's, we, we sort of we, we broke down the entrepreneurial voices that we talked to into the sort of um, A, B and C and those who really taught about the muscle, those who not really taught about it and those who just haven't got there yet but recognize they have to get there. And again, a lot of them is just, just thinking ahead. So how do you, how do you sort of um, stay grounded in what you need to do today to move your business forward and move your organization, the company forward, but recognizing then there's a, there's, a, there's a journey you need to go on and what does that look like in the future? And the way then to look at those then is begin to think about well, what is the, what's the capability in the organization? What does the current... Um, leadership team look like? And what does that future leadership look like? Are we aligned as an organization? Are, we, are our problems being caused because we're not aligned? How do we avoid those problems? Um, what's the organizational language we use around problem solving? And often what you find in organizations, particularly when they're starting out, is we celebrate the hero. We celebrate the person who solves the problem. But what we need to do is, is move and celebrate the person who avoided the problem happening in the first place, the unsung hero in the first place. And so again, it's getting that balance right in the organization. And what's the language we use around problem solving and how do we sort of avoid problems around that? Stefan, I'll hand back to you. Okay, thanks, Martin. Yeah, our workout three is, is kind of moving ahead from just trying to generate customers and looking externally to actually building these internal capabilities in the organization. And many entrepreneurs, they're so keen on paying the bills, feeding the mouths, uh, just keeping everything afloat, 
that they just don't think about the organization. Sometimes it's too late and then it falls to pieces. So if you look at our um, comments from our entrepreneurial leaders, uh, some of them felt, okay, we've now got to the stage where we, we can stop being so obsessed with trying to get business every moment through the door and we can start building this internal structure. You know, we're a bit more stable now. <clears throat> uh, others feel, well, I was forced to do it. I didn't really want to. And you know, our C uh, choice of um, a leader we interviewed said that he just didn't like doing the internal stuff. And of course there are people like this. And as a entrepreneurial leader, you know, you play to people's strengths, but you definitely need to build those own, that own muscle, your own muscle in internal procedures and, and processes. And if we think about the workouts that we can use to build this, okay, we organize our customers, we have customer management systems, we share our data, <clears throat> we uh, do a strategic planning. These are things which often get forgotten in the early days of excitement of the start of the business and the first few um, customers that get signed up but it's a very essential muscle to build. Back to you, Martin. Thank you, Stephanie. But again, as we think about the muscle to be developed, this is the, the fourth muscle of the seven that we've identified, it's this role clarity. So what role do people play in the organization? And how do we define their roles better? And so often what you see at the start of an organizational journey is Everybody jumps in and does everything. The person who checks in with the customer is also the person who makes the coffee, who's the person who pays the electricity bill. Right? And people are just doing everything they can to get by. And then as the organization grows and scales then, it becomes a little bit more complex. And how do you define who's accountable more? What of that person who checks in with the customer is on vacation, who's checking with the customer? How do we make sure then that we um, create accountability in the organization and have a bit more clarity about um, who owns a particular um, decision, who owns a particular process? And often what you find as well as you're going through this journey as an organization is that people tend to do the job they like to do rather than the job that the organization needs them to do. And if everybody just keeps doing what they like to do, there's definitely aspects of the organization and the company, the journey, that are going to be less um, important and will be ignored. And so it's making sure then that you, you define what success looks like in this role. And again, as we talk to the entrepreneurs about this, it's like, it's like just understanding that um, how you change your role, how you change your scope, right? And you can't do everything. You particularly can't do everything as a, as a leader in the organization. So how do you just make sure that you, you, you find that? And it's very challenging. Again, the, the, the sort of the, the team running through all of these muscles is just this balance, is getting the balance right between the two and just being having a self-awareness about what you need to do. And a lot of this then is just thinking about the, the role that people perform in the organization, what they're accountable for, what the success look like, starting to be a bit more clear about that. And there's going to be critical roles in the organization and defining what those critical roles <clears throat> are and making sure people are very accountable for that. And also there's an aspect of future-proofing your organization as well, just future-proofing this. So what's the muscle that you might need tomorrow? And going back to that, um, one of the previous examples of the muscles is that anticipating the future. Is there a capability? Is there a skill set? Is there a muscle that you don't necessarily need today, but you might need in three months or six months from now? And just recognizing what that might look like and what that might be like. Stephanie, I'll just hand back to you. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, coping with risk. And as Martin said in the introduction, when you first start a, a, a business, there you know, it could be risk that it doesn't actually even hardly leave the doormat and it doesn't really get going. But of course, as the business grows, it takes on different forms of risk. And 
the entrepreneur needs to be able to <coughs> excuse me um, cope with this evolving manner of judging and appraising risk and if we look at the um, people the quotations from the people some of the people we interviewed there are still a lot of people um, with startup businesses who you know who just go ahead with whatever happens and if a customer asks for something they don't think oh have we got the capability of doing it they just say yes to everything and worry about it later with some kind of belief that everything will work out in the end uh, people who come uh, entrepreneurial leaders who become a bit more savvy start comp compartmentalizing the risk okay um perhaps we'll have 80 20 risky and safe projects maybe we'll have eventually evolved to 80 percent um, safe projects and only 20 uh, risky ones but we will take a changing view of risk as it evolves and that can become more managed and measured as it changes and of course there's internal and external risk as well uh, different customers different products uh, recruiting new uh, colleagues in the business there are all different kinds of risks and the, the savvy uh, muscular entrepreneurial leader who's developed this risk-taking muscle can uh, look at these risks in a very different way so in the, these are in the, in the workouts, internal, external people, delegating. Uh, okay, the, it's always risky to delegate. You don't know how experienced the person is, but you can be sure that if you never delegate, you're never going to get anywhere. So we always have to take that risk. What kind of risk appetite do the people have in the organization? What kind of risk um, culture are we developing in our business? And perhaps at the beginning, it, we had a huge um, risk-taking culture. Now, we don't want to lose that completely, but it will change over time. And we need to appreciate this. There will be an evolution. Back to you, Martin. Thank you, Stephanie. So the second last muscle that we, we, we talk about is this handling cultural change. And, and what do we mean by culture? And culture is just how we do things around here, how we make decisions, how we hire people, how we reward people, how we think about the quality of work we do. Just what does that look like and feel like in an organization? And it's often every organization has its culture, whether that is consciously or unconsciously designed it. And often in growing an organization or changing an organization, you're, you're changing a mindset, you're growing a mindset, you're scaling a culture, and you're scaling a mindset, an approach to how we do things around here. And so a lot of this then is just identifying is what does that culture look like in our organization? But also to grow and develop, it's not getting caught in that culture fit trap is that it's been culture additive. It's not that someone fit to our culture, it's that someone brings something to our culture that will help us grow and develop. And there's a huge component of diversity and equity and inclusivity in thinking about that. I'm having this conversation, I'm a privileged white male. If I think about culture fit in an organization, we don't want an organization that is full of white males. What we want is an organization that reflects the diversity of the society, the diversity of the customers, the diversity of the environment in which we're operating. And so thinking about that is that does the person that we want to bring into the team add something extra? Do they bring something to our culture? And how is our culture strengthened by being able to absorb those different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things? Because that's how we would grow and develop. And how do we integrate and strengthen those aspects in your organization? And so, again, how do we talk to the entrepreneurial leaders we have is that, and, you know, similar thing about that, we're very focused on the culture and very structured in how they think about it, very market oriented. Some reckon they didn't have a culture, but of course they do, because a culture is how we do things around here. 
and stuff gets done around here. So how does that work? Again, it's recognizing that. And it's how do we think about the decision-making culture in the organization? Is one person responsible for a decision or is it a number of people? How do we think about our hiring practices? How do we think about our organization reflecting the diversity, equity, inclusivity that we want in the world around us? How do we think about the language we use in the organization? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And what's that offboarding process, as an example, look like? And again, we always talk about the balance because of this balance. One of the acid tests of culture, and forgive my language in advance, but it's a, it's a quote from, from one of the entrepreneurs, is that what do you do with the brilliant asshole in your organization? That person who is fundamentally critical, they're brilliant at what they do, but the manner in which they do it is not conducive to creating a positive, <clears throat> engaging, inclusive environment. And where do you make that trade-off between the two and getting the balance? And just constantly being aware of uh, and spending time thinking about how do we want to do things around here? And how do we hire people who will add to our culture, who will bring diversity to our culture, who will bring uh, a way of thinking to our culture that will help us grow and develop as an organization. And it's not just about what people do, it's the way in which they do it, which will strengthen and grow and develop organizations. I'm trying to get that balance right um, as, a, as, as a company to grow. I'm gonna hand back to Stephanie now for the, the final uh, uh, muscle. Okay, thanks, Martin. This, the, the final muscle, and um, we like this one as the last one because it's kind of ongoing. And this is building a growth mindset. Um, being open to feedback, being receptive, yet not getting too upset by when things don't go right and you know they're not going right. Being able to accept criticism, feedback, but in a constructive way and thinking about the long term and your own personal growth uh, and that of everybody in the organisation. And, you know, I'm teaching my class at uh, Nichols College tonight and it's very, very nice having this this classroom full of people with a growth mindset. Oh, I want to learn about culture. I want to learn about the world. I want to learn about global business. I can grow and I can be a, a more growth oriented person if I've got these new skills. And we found this was very, you know, very important for our entrepreneurial leaders because uh, they all want to give people, sometimes quite young and quite inexperienced, uh, great opportunities. And in many startups, <clears throat> especially because uh, they're just a gang of people, uh, they don't have a big budget for hiring expensive people, but we'll get onto that. Uh, but they might give opportunities to, to young people beyond what they might get in a more established organization. And you know, these people are kind of sinking or swimming. Not only are they swimming, they're kind of winning the, the swimming race. Uh, but uh, people with um, growth mindset can manage this continuous evolution of the organization. Um, if they're putting up barriers to growth, like mm, um, what kind of people are we going to recruit? Maybe we can do it all by ourselves. Then it's going to be stressful. It won't lead to growth. So in a way, this is a very appropriate final muscle to keep working on because that growth mindset must keep being developed and it will be keeping to look out for what's happening and changing in the environment around us, uh, how the customers are changing, how the employees are changing, uh, needs and <clears throat> technology, everything. And that growth mindset must be there, uh, however hard it may seem at the time. So anyway, we're going to discuss some examples and how we can bring all this to life in the practical current world. Thanks, Stephanie. So just, uh, we'll just spend a couple of minutes then just sort of bringing this into, into the real world and some sort of real life examples of this. So, um, and, and again, there are multiple examples across multiple countries in which we can go over. I just picked out a few here that I'm personally aware of. So letting go of autonomy. Um, so so uh, sort of two examples here. One is a, is a UK-based bank 
called Monzo, and the, the founder of that organization um, has grown that um, exponentially, very, very successful organization. But about a year ago, um, was very open about the fact that um, sort of the pandemic was having an impact on his uh, mental wellness and stress levels as he tried to grow his organization and just took that decision then to um, step back in the organization, hire a, a president in the organization, then who take on the responsibility of the role, just, just being able to sort of let go and let go of, of, of what that was. And again, Property Guru is a Singapore-based um, property company, um, two founders. And um, over the last two years, they have been very, very thoughtful about the fact that actually they don't have the skill set um, to take the organization to the next level, being very aware of that. And they've been very thoughtful with their own board about um, hiring in a new CEO. They're still on the board of the company, just making sure then they're letting go. And this is one of the one of the hardest things for entrepreneurial leaders who found organizations to let go. It's very difficult. Um, the anticipating future problems. And, and often we think that, um, particularly in the focus of this conversation, has not been around technology organizations, that you know, um, all technology organizations, they're founded one week and next week they're, they're worth a billion bucks. That's not the case. Often it takes um, timing for this to happen. And what is the future problem? So you've got a company called ChargePoint, which is a, a company based out of Campbell in California. And they're involved in the um, electric recharging business, the whole sustainability. And they're thinking about climate change. And they were founded in 2007. So 14 years ago, 15 years ago at this stage. And again, um, sort of how their organization now has, has looked ahead. And they're at the forefront then of electric sort of mobility and sustainability. Um, Headspace is an example of a company that was founded in 2010. So 11 or 12 years ago. And again, this is focused on the mental wellness and it's in, in the mental wellness arena. And again, they've just um, merged with another organization in a one billion pound deal. And part of what they've been about is obviously growing through this time, but obviously through the pandemic, um, the awareness and the impact of the pandemic on people's mental wellness um, has been exponential. So really be helping to address that and sort of looking ahead to that uh, in a very, very powerful way. Um, Switching your focus from, from outside your organization to inside your organization. So uh, two examples here is there's a, there's a fashion company called um, For Days, which is uh, based in the US. And it's actually a, um, a zero waste company. And so again, as you think about the fashion industry, often it's being accused of having a, a, a throwaway culture of you buy an item of clothing and then you throw it away. This organization has set up what's known as a circular um, economy in the sense that uh, when you buy uh, an item of clothing to them, you recycle it back through the same company. And then you earn credits on that. And again, just thinking about that sustainability aspect of fashion, hugely, hugely powerful, taking something external and bringing it into your organization as well. And they look at a, a company like Checkout. Um, Checkout is a... Um, a European-based um, sort of uh, financial technology company who power a lot of the processing behind some of the biggest companies in the world. It's one of these companies you've never heard of. And again, they're focused on the ex external market, and, but they've built a wonderful internal operational machine to execute on that. And they've really been able to match as their organizations that they support have grown, they've been able to match that growth as well. And it's been a huge success story for them that as the organizations have grown, they've grown with them as well. Um, this allows for all evolution. Um, this, is, this is always a key one in, in organizations as, 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 as leaders grow and develop what roles do they play in the organization. And uh, you know, one of the, um, the big examples of recent years has been Google, where it was founded by Larry uh, Page and Sergey Brin. And then uh, one of them was CEO for a little while, but then as they came to sort of a, an IPO, recognizing then that they needed somebody who had more experience as a CEO to take them through the next phase of the journey and sort of stepping back into uh, different roles in the organization and allowing Eric Schmidt then to come on board as the CEO of the organization. And then over time, then one of them stepping back into that role as well. So just clarifying roles, clarifying responsibilities around that as well. Um, coping with risk. And risk has been a factor uh, in the last two years across the entire world, as whole business models have been disrupted, uh, as ways of doing things have been totally disrupted, and organizations have had to look at things in a very, very different way. An example I'll give you then is a, is a uh, 
uh, female founded entrepreneurial uh, organization called Farm Girls Files based in California. And again, what they were trying to do was to source locally in the sort of California area for delivery in the California area. A little bit before the, the pandemic, they, they recognized that they were concentrated in one particular place. So then they looked to source um, some of the goods from outside the US and import them into the US. And what happened then with the pandemic was then, uh, as we're all aware, businesses had to shut down. Businesses had to stop doing their thing. And they recognized that they had to have made this pivot a little bit beforehand and, and their, their business model was gone. Table 22 is an interesting one. It's just, it's just got a $7 million um, input of capital. But Table 22 was originally founded as a rental accommodation company for students two years ago. As you can imagine, during the pandemic, rental accommodation just absolutely dried up. And it pivoted its organization then to um, work in the digital hospitality space. So helping restaurants then, who obviously have to close themselves, but able to deliver those to their different um, different constituents and different customers. Again, just recognizing the risk and some risk you can control, some risk you can influence, and some risk you can't control at all. And just recognizing that part of business and, and getting that balance right. And managing cultural change, the one I call out here is, uh, is Bolt. Bolt is a, an Estonian, uh, Eastern European um, sort of delivery and transportation app, uh, very similar to an Uber uh, or a Grab, that would be a good way to describe them. And they've talked a lot about their culture. They've talked a lot about how they have grown. Uh, they're now in 100 countries, uh, 45 countries uh, internationally, 100 cities, and how, how they've had to adapt and be culture additive because the ways in which things were done in Estonia and Eastern Europe were different than outside of the organization and added different people who brought different perspectives brought that diversity, that equity, inclusivity. And that's, they, they very much talk about the fact that that's been one aspect of, of their growth. Um, and it's just a final example then here of growth mindset. Um, and so um, Bumble is a female oriented dating app, uh, which floated about, uh, about a year ago on, on, on the stock exchange. And this, uh, uh, the person here is Whitney Hurd, who was one of the uh, senior executives at Tinder, uh, the other dating app, and had to leave that under circumstances which were um, sort of at the time, um, allegations of sexual harassment, et cetera. So uh, not a good experience for, for that, this person, but learned from that experience and grew from that experience, right? And then focused on a female dating app then, which then was floated then um, about a year ago, and she became the youngest self-made uh, billionaire in the world, and also the youngest female CEO to take a company public. And again, just having that, mindset of that growing and learning and things will not, will not necessarily work out the first time. So taking that aspect of things into account as well. So again, having that growth mindset in your organization, growth mindset and how you do things. I'll just hand back to Stephanie just to finish off and then we can uh, take some questions. Okay, thanks Martin for uh, bringing us up to date with so many interesting examples. And of course we've got hundreds more, uh, but just to make a few takeaways, uh, as we draw to a close, uh, but of course, we're just trying to stimulate your uh, further questions. Uh, it's very much a team sport, being an <clears throat> being entrepreneurial leader. It's um, a complex job. Nobody can do it by themselves. It's constant awareness and reflection. What am I doing that's working? What am I doing that's not working? Uh, constant learning, uh, always on the lookout for what's new, what's different, what, what should I know? Uh, where's the next change coming from? Uh, everything will evolve. We must have diversity. So we've got diverse views and challenges and confrontation and thinking. And everybody needs to keep developing and growing. Uh, market opportunities may come and go very quickly. We have to keep being on the lookout. We can never be too comfortable. We've got to think of today and tomorrow simultaneously in our brains at the same time. And <clears throat> there's no one way of doing it. What we've just suggested here have been muscles that can help you in that journey. And, you know, you need to keep going to the gym every night because you can't just stop. There's always a new muscle to work on and you have to keep going and it's hard work. So uh, Martin, would you like to add anything to that little roundup? Sure, thank you for that, Stephanie. And I'll leave it one piece of data, which Stephanie and I spoke about last night. So 
the um, the latest ranking of unicorn companies globally, which is obviously any company, private company that, that is valued over a billion dollars. There's currently 964 of those globally that are valued at about $3.3 trillion. Not every one of those are going to make it to that next level, right? That's, a, that's an obvious thing that will happen. And, you know, there are various reasons why they will or won't make that. And one of the reasons that we suggest and we talk to entrepreneurs is that you're more likely to give yourself an opportunity and chance to get there is by thinking about that entrepreneurial leadership, people, muscle capability in your organization, reflecting on where's the balance in your organization, where is the balance in terms of your capability, where is the balance in terms of your diversity, where is the balance in terms of, of how you want to move forward as an organization. And you're more likely to be successful as an organization, whether that's a startup organization, whether that's a, a company who's more mature and wants to go in a different direction, or an organization goes to transformation. If you reflect as an organization on your capabilities and your strengths. And the last thing I'll leave you, which comes across consistently in my own experiences and also the experiences that we have with entrepreneurs, it's a team sport. The myth of the one person doing this all themselves is purely a myth. This is totally a team sport. And the more you have people on that journey, the more diverse that group is on the journey, the more likely you are to be successful. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Appreciate that. Um, I'll hand back to Robin. I think we'll um, take a few questions and I'll stop, uh, I'll stop sharing from here. Wow. So thank you so much, Dr. Jones and Dr. Tynan. Um, this was an inspiring, informative, and really practical presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that have already come in in the, in the Q&A box, um, and we have some time. So please type any questions you have using that Q&A uh, button on Zoom. Um, so the first question is um, this. It says, you spoke about founder-led leadership. It could be difficult to replicate the motivation founders have for a business unless professional managers become shareholders or partake in profit sharing to some extent. To only feel like an owner and not being one is a dangerous illusion. At what stage of development or size should a leader seriously start thinking about delegating power and decision making? Stephanie, do you want me to take that one? Yes, please. It's a very good question. Yeah, no, really, really good question here. So first of all, I think there, there, there is no specific answer to that because I think the, the, the in terms of exact answer, because there's no playbook, there's no, there's no blueprint for that or how that happened. But how I'll answer that is, and I think there, there's, some, there's, a, there's some mega trends happening globally, which I think have been accelerated by the um, pandemic. And I think what, um, certainly my own experiences and entrepreneurs I've spoken to recently as well, it's not just the financial motive that people need to feel like an owner and a friend. That is one element of it. But more and more, what we are seeing is people are looking for purpose. They're looking for an organization that they can connect with. They look for an organization that can share their, their values as well. So I think it's about um, bringing people into your organization that will connect with your organization that will connect with the purpose of the organization and the mission of the organization. And what we're seeing more and more of, and certainly in my own limited experience, is organizations having to be more thoughtful about their impact in the world, about their impact around diversity and inclusion, their impact around um, sort of sustainability, their impact around climate change. And so what we're finding more and more is companies that are, uh, providing people with a purpose, providing people with a mission are more likely to attract what is more and more scarce talent in the organization. So I think, of course, and to go back to your original question, there is a, there is a financial component to that. But I think what we're seeing, and certainly what I see, but it's, it's open to a conversation, like the much bigger one, is around the whole aspect of moving from shareholder capitalism to a more stakeholder capitalism aspect in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's certainly sort of some, some interesting trends around that. And as you look at the Great Resignation, which actually, if you really peel it apart, is a little bit of a myth. Because what the Great Resignation, what the early insight is showing us is that people are moving away from organizations 
that are not allowing them to connect with the purpose and the mission to have that founder and that real mm -hmm. um, owner feel and moving to organizations that will allow them to do that. Um, Stephanie, anything else you'd add there? No, I think you've covered quite a lot. Certainly yeah. this purpose element, I would very strongly recommend because people have got to be very proud of their organization and want to uh, shout from the rooftops, you know, what, where it is they work and who for and why and how. Uh, and you've got to have that, otherwise people are not going to be motivated. And the payment part is just part of it. So I would certainly support that, that view. Yeah, good question. Thank you. All right, so we have another question here. Um, this one's about role clarity and role ambiguity. I feel the balance between role clarity and role ambiguity is a complex one. The more you define roles, the more you push for specialization and box people's thinking skills. At the same time, restricting the entrepreneurial mindset that requires flexibility in roles, given the company more strategic agility. How do you suggest a company should balance this? Thank you for the question, David. Stephanie, do you want me to take this one? Ooh. Uh, wow, it's a very good one again. Um, <clears throat> okay, people need to have a focus for what they're doing uh, and clarity, and everybody needs to know who does what in order to have a structure and processes. But it's actually a very good point because you can't um, hem people in too much because then you're losing that creativity. And also you still got to have an all hands to the wheel uh, mentality in the event of a crisis. So it's, it's probably not black and white. It's not one or the other, but it, if you can combine role clarity for maybe a certain proportion of, of the time, but have that ambiguity and flexibility as well. Mm, sounds great. What do you think, Martin? Yeah, no, really great question, David. And I think it's, and it's definitely all about balance. So I will, I will speak from my own personal perspective here. So I think it depends on the organization and also depends on the role that person performs in the organization. So within some organizations, then you will obviously want um, level, different levels of role clarity and role ambiguity. But even within roles you might need a, a a role that that there's not much scope for ambiguity in that particular role but what you want to try and do is allow the person to develop that role and grow that role and i will give you an example from my own experience so when i hire people into the organization that i work for I, I hire for a growth mindset i hire for people who have done that extra piece in their job and what i always say to people is i'm the role will be 70% defined and 30% defined by you. And how you will grow is that when you come on board first, that role will take you 40 to 45 hours a week, whatever that is, right? And then as you get better at that role, that role then will take you 35 hours a week. Now then you have a choice. What do you do with those extra five hours? Do you grow or develop or take an extra coffee break? What do you do, right? And so what you want to try and do is have that mentality of people to recognize, actually, my role is to make the job easier to do, more efficient than when I found it in the first place. And then when I do that, then I give myself time for growth. I give myself time for development. And then you have a conversation with somebody. Well, what does that look like? Is that improving your current job or is that moving to a different job? Or how does that balance? Now, I think it depends on the mindset of the person coming on board because you need to hire for that mindset. It also depends on the mindset of the organization that they're coming into. And this is about this matching the two. So for instance, if you put that type of person perhaps into maybe a compliance role in a very highly regulated environment where there was not much scope for ambiguity, it would not necessarily be successful. But you will, in that role, you might need somebody who then who understands that actually there's not much balance in that role as well. So it's just kind of matching the mindset of the person, the capability and their motivation with the mindset and capability and motivation of the organization. That you how I describe that one. But great question, David. So we have one more question, which is just about what we have time for. And the question is, are there specific team exercises that can help my team embrace a growth mindset in its day-to-day -day operations? Should we, should we be encouraging small changes before large? I will speak to this, Stephanie, as I'm a big fan of this. So I've got, I've got two children. 
And what I try and do is I, I try and give them a growth mindset. And one of the most powerful words you use is the word yet. I can't do this yet. I can't ski yet. I can't do algebra yet. Because that means then you will at some point in the future. So one of the most powerful ways in which you do this, and certainly from my own experience, is uh, you probably came across the stop, start, continue concept. So a little thing on your job is that think about your role, think about your job, think about your organization. What is the one thing that we are really good at doing, we should continue to do, that gets you thinking about it. What is the one thing that is stopping us doing stuff that we should think about stopping because it's not a good thing to do? And what is the one thing that we should start doing because it will make a difference? And then if you start that in very, very small increments, then that really gets that, that juices flowing of that mindset. And what it does, it gets people thinking about the role as part of an ecosystem, the role as part of their responsibility. And this goes back to the very first question that David had. It's your role as an owner. You own the job. You own the company. What do you do to improve it? What do you do to move it forward every time? Now, obviously, you have to create the right, the right environment, create the right structures, the right reward structures, the right safe psychological space for that to happen. But it's creating that safe psychological space allows you to say, what should we stop? What should we start? What should we continue doing? And you can do it in a very, very small way. I think it would be very powerful. Stephanie, anything you would add there? I think that, yeah, that, that's great. Um, because that helps to keep this growth mindset going. And... I mean, our, our book, I mean, we've kind of plugged our book all the time. It's very nice everybody to uh, give us indulgence to listen. But in our book, we have got lots of practical hints and tips, haven't we, Martin? Geared around these mindsets, these seven entrepreneurial mindsets, in order to uh, help achieve uh, changes in your team and to improve step by step. Um, you might not need all the muscles straight away. You might have your own priorities, but you, you can just cherry pick bits that you like but it's an overall concept which you can build up and the book is very practical and we're always very happy to hear from anybody with uh, particular tips and hints we're very happy if anybody wants to contact us in the future and um, <clears throat> thanks again Robin for this opportunity to uh, talk to this very nice crowd at um, Nichols College. Yes thank you uh, Stephanie and Martin for sharing your wonderful book with us. Um, and I, I'm just going to plug your book one more time for you, because remember, you can purchase the book on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. Um, and I'll just share personally, I really felt that this was a really fabulous presentation to start off my professional development for 2022 with. Um, as a leader who, you know, is in a traditional, more traditional organization, but wants to have an entrepreneurial spirit, I picked up lots of great information and can't wait to start working out um, some of the skills here. Um, we'll be following up with all the participants in the next day or so um, with a post event evaluation and a link to the recording so that you can share it with others that you feel would be interested in this topic. And we hope you enjoy today's presentation and will join us for an upcoming masterclass webinar um, here at the Graduate School of Nichols College. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you. Good day. Thank you.